everybody. Materium here. Um, just figure I'm going to do a little bit of talking here. I'm working on painting some models for Warhammer, but I decided I'm going to do some talking about role-playing games, and more specifically, a response to a video <clears throat> that I saw a couple of days ago now from uh, our main man, uh, Andrew Wood. Uh, for those of you from my Warhammer side of videos who, who don't know him, he's uh, apparently a pretty big deal in the, the YouTube side of role-playing, and he's done some really fun videos and, and is a very uh, entertaining and engaging fellow. And his most recent video was about gnomes in Dungeons and Dragons. Now he did one, I, I'm guessing two years ago or so from the date stamp, where he basically just completely in character ripped into how gnomes are goofy and anybody playing them is silly and you know all, all of the standard stuff that gnome players catch a lot of crap for. But this one was, well frankly it was a more serious take and, and understanding about the gnomes, and as I listen, most of what his point seemed to be is that the gnomes get kind of lost in the creative mental space between halflings and dwarves, and that makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, you, if you look at them, they are kind of in the middle of the two races, and so he was kind of positing some ways to make the race unique and, and interesting and kind of give them their own voice. And what he focused, focused on primarily was the physical attributes, at least sort of the, the they're way smaller than everything. And so kind of play up the, the role playing advantages that, or role playing opportunities, I guess would be a better word, that there are in playing something who, whose point of view is so entirely different than uh, sort of a normal human's just from the pr perspective they have, the literal perspective they have. I thought that was a very interesting thing, and, and there's definitely some good ideas there, and he made a comment to the effect that he has never played with anybody in his entire gaming career that made a big deal out of gnomes, that either played them regularly or had them as a major part of their campaign world and, and whatnot. And, um, well, I guess I, I should out myself first. I'm apparently one of the folks that you've never played with, Ander, <laughs> um, because on my homebrew world of Megana, um, the gnomes have a pretty big part. And so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about my take on the gnomish people and what I think can really set them apart in terms of sort of a racial personality. Like, I, and I'm not saying that like on my world all of the, the gnomes are this one way, but if you look kind of in between the lines... I think the D&D &D writings give you enough of a kernel to make the gnomes truly different. And admittedly, I've added to this, as I've added to basically anything D&D &D has done in as it results in my game, or as it interacts with my game. But the kernel of it definitely came from the published writings. Now, I'll first specify that in D&D... &D, you usually have a split. Either the gnomes in your world are your normal gnomes, the, the I think D&D &D calls them the rock gnomes, which are all about illusions and, and kind of your forest folks, and those are the ones that frankly are very difficult to separate from either halflings or dwarves. Or you have the other alternative where you have the Tinker Gnomes. And these were originally, at least I'm going to say, I'm going to guess originally, it may have popped out in a Dragon magazine before this, but uh, they originally started in the Dragonlance 
campaign setting. And they're, I mean, for lack of a better word, they're tiny mad scientists. They create all sorts of kooky, crazy inventions that almost never work. And, and in the setting, they're kind of portrayed as comedy relief. And a lot of people have portrayed them as such since, so they kind of have that attitude. And for the most part, people either pick one or the other. Now, I'm going to tell you that in my world, I actually have both. And the reason that I have both is tied sort of fundamentally into this racial personality trait that I think really distinguishes the gnomes from either dwarves or halflings. And that is that the gnomes are very much obsessed with change. Um, if you look at the traditional rock gnomes as they're portrayed in the the second edition books, they are illusionists. And if you read the uh, book of gnomes and halflings, it talks about how fundamental illusions are in every aspect of their life. Everything from social interactions to, to mating rituals to... I mean, pretty much everything. Everything that, that the gnomes do, illusion has something to do with that. And so rather than just take that as, oh, that's the quirk because they can be gnome illusionists as a, a class, you really have to look at what that does to a culture, where the ability to change things and to create something out of nothing and, and to, to literally fool the senses is an innate part of your, your racial identity. And so then you look at the Tinker Gnomes, and they also have that power too, but in a much more physical, technological way. Because at its at its base, what is invention, if not a way to change the world around you? Sorry about that. A little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, but as I was saying, the ability to invent in, in the sort of out of the <laughs> nothing way that the Tinker Gnomes can is nothing short of an ability to create and to change the world around them as well. So in my world, this desire to change is a very fundamental way of the gnome way of looking at the world. Um, they're not a race that deals really in permanence. Um, things are always kind of shifting and changing with them because they really can force that change. I mean, when you, you have the, the ability where your race just can make something out of nothing in terms of the illusions, or, or you can break new bounds of science at any given moment, the ideas of long-standing tradition may not be as appealing as they were. And that being the case, I think it really sets them as the right balancing point amongst the short races. Because on one hand you have, well I guess in the middle, you have the halflings who are contentment really. They are happy with the world, the way the world is, but they don't have a great push to maintain the status quo or to change it. They're just there. They're sort of the neutral short race. Um, the dwarves on the other hand, they actively laud loud the, the the way things were, the traditions. They support what came before them and, and they actively resist change. And so you can definitely see them as a very lawful type of, of society. Whereas the gnomes, the way they, they are in my world, they represent that change. They are sort of the third wheel there, that, that force of chaos. And even so much that in the the world, they actually worship the god of chaos. And not in the same way that, like, barbarian hordes might worship it just for, like, raw chaos, but the, the 
rock gnomes kind of revere him as the father of dreams and the lord of illusions and the tinker gnomes view him as the god of inspiration and innovation and so it really gives it a very different take on the traditional gnomes and it's not really I mean, it's not like I've taken them past the point where they're unrecognizable, because everything that the basis for this is, is still pretty solidly within the, the, the writings of D&D, the, the stuff in the Gnome's Handbook, and the, uh, the base player's handbook, basically all the, all the base writings, um, now I do a little extra. I do give the rock gnomes a little bit of uh, like your level one illusion ability, uh, just kind of as an innate ability where they can kind of create little lights and that sort of thing. But I think it's because it makes sense how it supports that idea. And uh, never really had anybody take gnomes as a power gaming thing because they get that, so it's never been a big deal. Um, <laughs> The other thing that I've done to make the gnomes have more of a stake in the world, which I guess is one of the, the other big things that they could be seen as lacking, is that I've tied them directly into sort of their monstrous enemy race. Um, all of the good races have them. I mean, Dwarves and goblins are, are very typical, or if you want to get into the, the, the dark twin version, you got the uh, Derogar. Um, the elves, of course, have the drow. And I know some of you are like, well, the, the gnomes have the, what do they call them, the spriggan? Um, super not impressed with them. <laughs> so what I've done because if you look in the, the player's handbook for second edition now all of this is is based on second edition stuff as i explained in my first rpg talks video that's kind of where most of my heart lies but you'll notice that if you look in the fluff the gnomes have this weird unexplained hatred for codes it never i've read published for second ed why that is but if you look at the, the gnomes, and just, they hate kobolds and get a plus one to hit them. And the kobolds hate gnomes and will, like, kill them first off and won't accept surrender. Stuff like that. So, what I did is, I was like, you know what, that is the perfect fodder for a racial enemy. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I, I realize while I'm painting and talking, you guys must be spending, like, all of this time looking at the top of my head. I hope that's not too bad. Maybe I'll have to just do this as a voiceover next time with some uh, pretty pictures or something. But any rate, um, that's oh, I'm so used to doing battle reports where the pictures are already up there uh, for for Warhammer and not these RPG talks. So I'll have to get that in my brain. Um, but anyway, so the the kobolds are the racial enemy of the gnomes. And the the whole question there is, well, why? They have nothing to do with each other. Um, there, there, there's very little information provided. So I did what I always do in this circumstance, and I made up a fable. And the story basically goes, in in my world, one of the first wars after the various races was created was called the Goblin Wars. And a powerful goblin warlord by the name of Glug uh, decided that goblins were the only life, the only race worthy of life. And so he gathered all of the other green skins and basically led them on a war of extinction against every other race. And one of the first races that he reached were the gnomes. Because they were, their ancestral lands are very close by, so there's, there's, makes a good target. So the fable starts in these days where the goblins are closing in. The gnomes are outnumbered a billion to one. There's no way they're going to survive. And so the three elders of the gnomish race come together together. 
one tinker gnome, one rock gnome, or, and one uh, of what was called at the time a salt gnome. Now gnomes in the in the fluff, and and I think this is just kind of one of those weird throwaway things, but it mentions in in I think it's the book of gnomes and halflings that gnomes are like borderline obsessed with salty foods, and for some reason that was one thing that my gaming groups just absolutely grabbed hold of as their sort of defining trait for gnomedom. So the salt gnomes basically were the ones who mined the salt for for the the gnomes, and the way the gnomish economy works, that's a huge source of, of revenue for them, so you basically have the, the, the creators of the illusions, the creators of technology, and the wealthy, the, the, the wealthy mine owners of, of the gnome people, come together to try and figure out how they're going to save their race. So, the illusionist gnome basically comes up with this very convoluted idea where the tinkers are going to build them big boats to get away and they're going to use their illusion powers to mislead the goblins and allow the whole gnomish race to sail away. The salt gnome basically goes, well no, I got a better idea, let's just use our minds and we'll tunnel straight through the earth and go somewhere else. So. Obviously, they're outnumbered two to one. That's not the, the deal that got voted on. And they're like, well, you go back to your mines and pack all the salt for the journey. So, of course, being <coughs> underappreciated is never anything any gnome wants to be. So, ultimately, this rock gnome, or this salt gnome gives in to his jealousy that the other, ra the other two sub-races were able to help save the species, and he was not. And he basically is like, well, you know what, guys, we're going to just go dig, dig through the earth. Forget the, the gnomes that are going swimming. They're, they're just going to betray us. So the salt gnomes begin digging their way through and start laying traps and pitfalls and everything behind them. So they're doing that. The goblins start coming, and the other two gnomish races are getting ready to get on the boat, and they realize that none of the salt gnomes have shown up. So, they're like, well, you know what, we can't leave these, these gnomes, we, we've got to go help them. So they go into the salt gnomes' mines, start tripping over all the traps, they start dying, the salt gnomes who they're following think that the goblins are coming, so they turn around in the darkness and start fighting, and so, for the first time ever, gnomes kill gnomes. And, basically before he is killed, the, the head illusionist lays down this big curse that the cowardly salt gnomes will forever wear the visage of the, their, their cowardice upon them. And so they're all shapeshifted into these little rat dog forms which become the kobolds. And furthermore, uh, in this world, kobolds cannot tolerate salt. They are completely allergic to it. So not only do they get their visages changed, but all of the wealth that they had possessed is worthless to them. And so because of that, they become very bitter, and it really explains this long sort of enmity between the gnomes and the kobolds. Now I know that was a very, very long story, and, and I do apologize for those of you who fell asleep while I was telling it, but the the point of me illustrating that is it takes something that is presented in the write-ups i.e. your your racial enmity to to kobolds and it explains it and that's really what you need to do with with these races that don't seem to fit cuz there's a lot there that if you put some thought into you can really come up with good good explanations for why they are the way they are. And it really doesn't take, in my experience, doesn't take many players long to recognize the role-playing potential in stuff like that. If you can show them a race that's firmly grounded in the world and, and seems believable and is part of the, the mythology of the world, people are going to gravitate towards that. 
But if you show them the player's handbook and you go, oh, here are the, the elves and they're foresty, and here are the, the dwarves and they're the, the miners and the craftsmen, oh, and the gnomes are on that page. I mean, it's no big surprise that <laughs> that, that nobody's going to jump on that boat, right? Um, and I think that's something very important. Whenever you have a racial selection, and I've at, introduced other races... Uh, into my world as well, but the thing I always do before I I even put pen to paper for statistics or anything of that nature, I ask myself, what brought this race about? Where is their place in the world? Where is their place in the mythology? And if you can't answer that question, very simply, nobody will want to play that race, and nor should they, because then you're just an add-on. That's why, like, I know I know, Ander talks bad about the Warforged. I think they're stupid, too, so I'm not going to de- defend them. But, in Eberron, the world they came from, I can at least vaguely respect them because there's a mythology there. Now, I thought it was absolutely stupid once they started porting them out to every other world that just did not make any freaking sense that they were there. But that's what you need to do, and that's what I, I think is lacking in a lot with with the gnomes and why a lot of people don't play them much. But I, I would like to think that I've shown just in this 10, 15 minutes, whatever we're running on here, what little efforts can be made to take the gnomes from this sort of forgotten, wasted page and a half in a player's handbook to something that can be a worthwhile race with sort of ideologies of their own and a mythos of their own and and really show them where their place is in the world so i would challenge anybody who's who's making their own world or who is is interested in playing a gnome to do it to 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 engage that sort of difference to 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 pick something about them and flesh them out give them a place in the world um and i think the reason why you have to do that, is the gnomes are really the the only one of the base player races that didn't already get that treatment from Tolkien. He gave us those cultures for the elves, the dwarves, the hobbits, all of that. And there's really much less of that for the gnomes. There's a skeleton. But I think it's a rich skeleton. It's it's a skeleton that can support a lot of weight of of interesting character concepts and ideas. So... Um, but that's my response. I wanted to go ahead and get this out and, and get some thinking going. Uh, if you guys like the idea or didn't like the idea or think I'm cr- a crazy gnome lover, whatever, um, go ahead and put it in the comments down below. I'll be very interested to hear what other folks are, are talking about in the gnome conundrum. Um, I'm also going to try and link the original video from Ander down in the bottom so anybody who wants to can go see his point of view on things so thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you on the next RPG Talks